to live up to the claims of their faith. What they taught was fine. In fact, what they taught was the very best that could be found anywhere in the world because it was from God himself. But the reality is that what they taught and what they did failed to line up very well. It's a familiar situation. We are in the middle of political campaigning. I recall seeing a septic tank pumper truck. And on the side of it, it was written, full of campaign promises. You could kind of fill in your blanks there on that. We're reminded of the promises that remain unfulfilled, promises that are often broken, and promises that may have been outright lies from the very moment they were spoken. The people knew they couldn't perform what was promised. They had no intention of planning, of doing what was promised. Their only intention was to get elected. Uh, and I think we certainly see that. That's all they wanted. Our focus this morning is going to follow the pattern from Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. You have that reference there at the top of your notes. Nehemiah 8.8, 8, it's a time when the people had returned to the land following the Babylonian captivity. They had experienced some very hard times. Uh, and uh, Nehemiah 8 basically says this, that they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That's the purpose of a sermon, is to read in the book of the law of God distinctly, to give the sense and to cause the people to understand. A sermon is not about motivation. A sermon is not about making you feel good. A sermon is not about making you feel bad. I've heard plenty of those. A sermon is about telling you what God says, explaining that, and then letting us know where we should go in light of what God says. I give you the notes for our guests, uh, so I give you the notes so you can check me out. I don't give you the notes because I doubt your ability to listen effectively um, as I try to, to teach along and explain the word. I give you the notes so you can go back and look it up. You are not bound by what any preacher says. You're never bound by what the preacher says. You are bound by what God says. And the notes are there so you can go back and compare what the preacher said as you look back at the scripture and see how well it lines up with what God says. And whatever the preacher says that does not line up with what God says, feel free to discard. It won't bother me a bit. A couple, a couple, I guess it's been about a month ago now, well, four weeks ago, I was down in Jacksonville uh, on vacation and I spoke at my parents' church and it made me so nervous because as I was preaching, the people were not turning the pages of their Bibles. And, and, and it made me sense a, a very high level of responsibility that they're believing whatever I'm telling them. That was kind of scary. The idea that anyone would simply accept it because the preacher communicates with force or intensity or persuasiveness, that's a scary thought. But I think there's probably a lot of people like that. We work very hard here to not be that way, but to give you what the word says. And I always like it when someone comes up to me afterwards and said, preacher, you said this, and I'm not really sure about that. And I said, well, let's look at the text. Let's look at the scripture. It tells me that you're paying attention. Whenever I make a mistake and nobody notices, that's kind of a scary thought. In any case, they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, gave the sense, and caused the people to understand. Interesting question is, if the people don't understand, has any teaching really taken place? Interesting thought. In any case, after we understand the text, then we apply the text. You can never properly apply the text until you properly interpret the text and understand the text. It is not acceptable to just grab a phrase out of Scripture and do whatever you want with it. Before we can do that, we have to understand what the text says, what it means. What did it mean to the people to whom it was originally written? How did the Romans understand this? How did the Gentiles in Rome understand this? How did the Jews in Rome understand this? And until we get that, we can't say, how should we understand it and what should we do with it? And so that's our focus this morning. Now, as we come to our text this morning, Paul has been addressing the failures. We put on the, on the 
PowerPoint, turn your phone off, turn your phone off. I finally remembered to get mine. Uh, in any case, um, Paul has been addressing the failures, first of all, of mankind in general. In chapter 1, in verse 18, he speaks of God's judgment, God's wrath being revealed because God reveals himself in creation. People have an awareness of God, and yet they choose their own ways. It doesn't matter if they've ever heard of the Bible, if they've ever heard of Jesus Christ. All people have an inherent, innate awareness that there must be a creator. And so what they do with that, how they respond to that, makes them guilty before God. And so chapter 1 talks about that. As we go into chapter 2, Paul focuses on the Jews. Now the Jews had specifically heard from God in that God had revealed himself through Abraham, through Moses, through the prophets, and God would give them a specific message. And so in chapter 2, Paul focuses on the Jews. Uh, in verses 1 through 16, he stresses that they're guilty before God. They will be judged before God on the basis of their failure to obey. According to the law of God that had been given them, they disobeyed. In verse 14 and 15, Paul mentions an observable phenomenon, how that sometimes the Gentiles who do not have the law of God, and he says it twice there in verse 14, the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, who were the Ten Commandments given to? They were given to the Jews. It's interesting to me how many people tend to think that the Ten Commandments were given to everybody. They weren't. They were given to Moses for the Jews. When Moses came down, he asked them, will you follow these commands? And they said, yes, we will. And it was a covenant, the, the, the Sinai covenant, the Sinaitic covenant. They made a covenant to follow the law of God. They didn't do so well on that, but they promised that they would. The law was given to the Jews. Later in, Ro in Romans chapter 9, Paul will speak of the Jews to whom were given the promises, the Messiah, the law was given to them, the prophets came to them. There was a special relationship between God and the Jews. The Gentiles, when they happened to give evidence of having a moral awareness, the way he reads it is, the way he, Paul says it is, when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. Sometimes you will see Gentiles who don't know about the law of God do something and they'll behave in a way that is consistent with the law of God. Paul says, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Here's the essence of this, okay? Jews have the law. Gentiles do not have the law. The Jews look at the Gentiles and they see the Gentiles sometimes doing things that are in the law and understanding that it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to kill. And how is that? Paul says they show the work of God's law, which is beyond the Mosaic law, written in their hearts. Are we under the law today? I hope not, because we're here on the Lord's day. We're here on Sunday. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You go a little bit farther in Exodus, you get to, I think it's chapter 30, 31, and God clearly says that the, the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. The Sabbath was never a sign to all of mankind. The Sabbath was between God and Israel. I mentioned that. Let me give you the reference so you can write that down. Um, did I say Deuteronomy? It's in Exodus 31. Here's what it says. Verse 12, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Exodus 31, 12, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Verse 14, ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore. Verse 16, wherefore? The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Exodus 31 verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And then he links it back to creation for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth on the seventh day he rested. There's some people who will say, well, since God rested the seventh day, then everybody ought to observe the Sabbath. Guess what? It's never commanded for everybody. It does say right there in Genesis 
the creation, chapters 1 and 2, it might, might say it twice, but it says the Lord made all that he had made and he rested on the seventh day. Interesting, why did God rest? It wasn't that he was tired, okay? God doesn't get tired. The idea is that he had worked, he had created, and then he left off from working. Now, I think the principle, one day in seven rest, I think that's a good pattern. Uh, we've kind of stretched that. We get two days in seven, generally. We get Saturday off, and then we also generally get Sunday off. But a five-day work week is really not the biblical pattern. Incidentally, the Sabbath was never for worship. It was never for going to assembly. The Sabbath was to rest. In fact, if this was the Sabbath, most of you couldn't be here because you traveled farther than a Sabbath day's journey. On the Sabbath day, you were only allowed to go so far. So we're not, we're not under the Sabbath and picking up sticks and stoning people and all that. That was a covenant between God and Israel that was not. So write that down in your notes there. That's Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17. You can go back and look at that and, and check, that out, check that out. But when the Gentiles who don't have the law keep the law, Paul says they demonstrate a moral conscience. And I believe that is built into the heart of every man. People who do not know God, who do not know Jesus, there is in, an intrinsic, an inherent, a built-in awareness, a moral compass that defines for them right and wrong. Well, as we look at verse 17, and this is where we're starting this morning, Romans 2, 17, notice who Paul addresses. Verse 17. You get to it here. Behold, thou art called a... You'd have to be careful about that today because uh, that might be understood by some as a term of derision. You're such a Jew. Yes? That's not the sense in which it's used here. Incidentally, there are three terms that are used in Scripture. Paul refers to himself as a Jew in Acts 21, as an Israelite in Romans 11, as a Hebrew in Philippians. All three of these terms refer to the same people, but I've got a note in there from uh, Woodrow Kroll in his commentary, at least his section in the commentary, and he says this. In a technical sense, Hebrew is the racial name, their race. Israel is a national name, but Jew is a religious name of the sons of Jacob. So that's just an interesting note, interesting distinction. The Jews rested in the law. In fact, look at the text there, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. The Jews rested in the law because it was, according to Deuteronomy chapter 4, 6, the wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. I don't think you have a reference to that. That's uh, Deuteronomy 4, 6. Uh, the Jew did not have to travel to other parts of the world to study at universities because they would study the Torah, the law of God, the word of God. Incidentally, I don't know if you were aware of this, but although the Bible is not intended to be a textbook on history and science, it is historically and scientifically accurate. The Bible contains the definition of pi. And I still don't fully get it because I know that they taught me in math and I took math and don't mess with me on food day again. But they teach us in math that pi r square. Everybody knows that's not true. Pi r round. Cornbread r square. But pi r not square. Well, I said that a couple of years ago and actually a couple of people actually baked a square pie and round cornbread just to prove to me that pie are indeed square and cornbread are indeed round. In any case, the Bible is accurate scientifically. And so for the Jew, they were proud of the knowledge that they had. They could rest in that. They could be confident in that. The Jew trusted his law, the law of God, to be all that he needed and the very best education he could get. So he boasted in God who gave the law. Now, lest that sound a little bit cocky, we sang the song, My Glory All the Cross. That's straight out of Scripture. In Galatians chapter 3, 21. Um, no, actually, uh, it's, uh, let me get the right one here. 
uh, verse Galatians 6, 14, he says, but as for me, I will, Paul speaking, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's the Holman translation of that. But Paul says, I will boast in the cross. I will glory in the cross. Why will we glory in the cross? Not because of what we did, but because of the love that was demonstrated from God to us. So we glory in what's not ours. We glory in the cross. Now, the Jews gloried in the law. We've, as we've been through this, we've noted that keeping the Mosaic law can never bring salvation. Flip back, if you will, to uh, Romans chapter 3. It's also farther in your notes, but look back to Romans chapter 3. Let's touch on this now. Verse 19 and 20, Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become what? Guilty before God. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified as a technical term. It is a legal term. And what it means is declared righteous. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are righteous, but it means that the judge has declared you to be righteous. We are justified on the basis of God's grace and faith not on the basis of our own efforts and works. So no one will be justified in the sight of God, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law does not make us righteous. The law demonstrates that we are sinners. That was the purpose of the law, and it's very clear. We'll, that will relate to some of the things that we'll, we'll pick up a little bit farther on. So truth could not have been revealed any more clearly than it was to the Jews. And they had it. They had received it. And so they boasted in the law. They rested in the law. They boasted in God's grace toward them. That's verse 17. We see some more things continuing on. Verse 18. And knowest his will. How do you know God's will? For absolute certain, without a shadow of a doubt... No questions asked. This is the only way we can know God's will perfectly. Okay? Now, I would not say that the Holy Spirit does not impress our hearts. I absolutely believe that the Holy Spirit will prompt us and impress upon us things that we should do. But those come through the filter of our own heart, right? Guess what Jeremiah says about our heart? We referred to this last Sunday morning, Jeremiah 17, 9. It's not in your notes if you want to write it down. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You ever heard someone say, trust your heart? Whew, that'll get you in trouble. I've actually known of people to leave a spouse because, and I, I guess it goes back to the way that the rabbis interpreted um, Deuteronomy 22, where it says, if it come to pass that a man hath taken a wife and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, then let him write her a bill of divorce and on and on and on. The rabbis in Jesus' day came to Jesus in Matthew 19 and, and they said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for every cause? The liberal school under Hillel said, if your wife burns your toast, that is grounds for divorce. If your wife spins around in the street so that someone might see her ankles, that is grounds for a divorce. I don't guess they went to the beach. I, I didn't spend as much time on the beach because my bathing suit had a hole in the knee. And I wasn't sure the elbow was getting a little bit weak too. Well, in any case, if, if the wife spoke ill of her mother-in-law, that was grounds for a divorce. The conservative side says, no, 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 you can't hardly get divorced for almost anything. And so the question went on. But in our culture today, we have this idea that just, you know, whatever, you know, just get another wife. It's okay. The most liberal school in Jesus' day said this. If it come to pass that you see another woman and she is more favorable than your wife, then that shall cause your wife to lose all favor in your eyes. And that meets the qualifications of Deuteronomy. Divorce her and get the new one. That was kind of the mindset. Does it sound a bit like our culture today? Okay. Now let me just say this since I raised this issue, okay? There is an unpardonable sin. 
and divorce ain't it. Okay? Jesus gave grace. Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, gave grace. Okay? It is not the unpardonable sin. And in spite of the fact that many have made it so, our response to one another, whatever it is, must always be one of grace and love. Amen? None of us are in a position to be in the parking lot picking up rocks. In fact, if you've got a pocket full of them, just go outside and dump them out right now. We'll wait. All right. That's not our position. In any case, they were looking for all kind of ways to get around the law of God. All of it had been given so clearly and they, they were working at how they could get around it. In any case... You know his will. I've heard people say, it's God's will that I divorce my husband and marry this new woman. Or new, yeah, we have that too. <laughs> it's God's will that I divorce my husband and get a new one, or that I divorce my wife and get a new one. I can tell you on the basis of God's word, it's probably not. God grants permission for divorce in some conditions, but God never, God never commands divorce. God allowed, in fact, Jesus says that. Because the hardness of your heart, God, God suffered it in Matthew 19. God allowed it. Let me say, even if you're the one who, were guilt, who was guilty and you had an affair and you were wrong and your marriage blew apart and it was all your fault, nothing's ever all one person's fault. There's still grace and forgiveness with God. Amen? Amen. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. In any case, um, to know the will of God, the only way we can know it for sure is Scripture. It's not what we feel. It's not what we think. It's what does God say. People say, I, I, I know God told me. I always want to say, well, show that. Where's that? No, no, no. God told me in my heart. I do understand the Holy Spirit prompts, but be very, very careful about that. You better make sure it lines up with Scripture because I've heard people say God told me, and I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, God did not tell you that because it violates Scripture. God will never tell you something that goes against the revealed, written, codified, spelled out text of his word. Well, back to the text. You know his will. You approve the things that are excellent. The idea is you know what's best. Why? Being instructed out of the law. Then he lists out four things in verses 19 and 20. Here's what he says. You're confident that you're a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness... You are an instructor of the foolish and a teacher of babes. Now, I understand that that might sound derogatory, okay? You're a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, a teacher of babes, an instructor of the foolish and a teacher of babes. But the essence of this is, here's the essence of it, okay? The Jews had the word of God, the Gentiles did not. They did not know the word of God. They did not know the will of God. They did not know what was best. So for a Jew to declare the word of God to someone who did not have the word of God, that's in essence what it was. But the problem was not that they had been given the word of God with a view to communicate the truth of what God says. The problem was that they weren't following it themselves. And so as Paul goes through these things there, he, he says there, uh, you have a form of knowledge and of the truth and law. The idea is that, is that God has given them the truth. Holman says this, they had the full expression of knowledge and truth. God had given them his light to be his witness to the world. And they had dropped the ball. In the great relay of life, communicating, teaching God's truth. God had passed to the Jewish nation his baton of truth, and they dropped it. They dropped it. Interesting, at the end of verse 20, if you have another version besides the King James, if you have the ESV, the Holman, the NIV, the RSV, I don't think NAS has it, but if you have those versions, instead of a period at the end of verse 20, you'll have a dash. Any of your Bibles have that? Okay. All right. Paul stops so abruptly as he gives that list. It's like he doesn't finish the sentence. It's like he's saying, you know, you guys, you guys think you're a guide to the blind, light to the darkness, a teacher of the foolish, a teacher of babies. <clears throat> he's so frustrated, he goes to the next thing. If you teach it, haven't you taught yourself? Verse 21, thou that teachest, he says, 
Didn't you teach yourself? You preach a man should not steal. Do you steal? Interestingly, uh, the word steal there is the Greek word klepto. We get our English word from that, kleptomaniac. I recall of the guy who was under treatment with his psychologist for kleptomania, and the doc says, well, how you doing? He said, doc, I'm doing so much better. Whenever I feel the urge to steal, I just take something for it. All right, well, I'm not sure that helps or not, but uh, th that's the idea. You steal. He says, you, you uh, verse um, 22, you say a man shouldn't commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You know, we have the, the uh, woman taking adultery, John chapter 8. They brought to Jesus the woman. Guess who wasn't there? The man wasn't there. You can't catch someone in the act of adultery and the woman be the only one in the room. But they brought the woman. Jesus stoops down to write in the dirt. It has been speculated that he may have been written the name of the rabbi that was the one who volunteered to do the entrapment. And one by one, they all went away. It was like they were sitting there and all of a sudden it came to them that it has been, had been over three months and 3,000 miles since they had changed the oil in their camel. It's like, guys, I, I got to go. It's, it's oil change day. I'm out of here. From the oldest... To the youngest and they all disappeared but Jesus says you, you preach that do you live it he goes on thou that abhorrest idols does thou commit sacrilege is the way the King James reads almost all other versions um, have this uh, you preach against idolatry do you steal idols from the pagan temples um, that was one of the things that was forbidden, was to take the idolatrous objects of worship. In Ephesus, when Paul is preaching, the town clerk speaks up and he defends Paul and his colleagues. And he says, here, here are these guys. They're not robbers of your temples. King James has church, but the Greek word is hierus. They're not robbers of your temples. So that was something that happened. And part of the reason for that was because people would keep safe deposit boxes at their temple. They thought it would be safe there. You know, so they would, they would leave their, the temple was also the bank. They leave their money. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. That was, that was commonly practiced. And so people would break into the pagan temples and they would steal people's savings. And so the clerk at Ephesus says, these guys are not robbers of temples. And apparently it was something that the Jews may have done because Paul seems to address this. Josephus, the historian, he represents Moses as addressing the people near Jordan just before his death. And this is one of the exhortations, quote from Josephus. Let none blaspheme the gods which other cities revere, nor rob foreign temples, nor take treasure that has been dedicated in the name to any god. So... The idea is, well, we don't practice idolatry, but if we happen to be near the temple and we can sneak in and get something, you know, Paul says, do you do that? Don't do that, he says. He continues on, verse 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. Here's the idea. You say, this is the law, it's so important, and yet they don't, they don't follow it. And by breaking the law, they dishonor God. Verse 24 continues, for the name of God, look at it. Romans 2, 24, for the name of God is what? Blasphemed. That's pretty intense. Blasphemy, that's, that's one of the commandments. It's blasphemed through you or because of you. It's a quote from Isaiah 52. And Isaiah says, because of your inconsistency, because of your disobedience, the Gentiles see you. You're supposed to be the people of God, the people with the law, the people with the commandments, and you break the law and they don't believe me what God says because you break the law they speak against my name they blaspheme me the Jews were consistent in their inconsistency when it came to keeping the law the history of the nation of Israel is the history of a people who both failed to remember their history and they failed to learn the lessons of their history. I often say this, people who do not learn from history, and I heard it from someone else, are destined to repeat history. 
If you don't learn from the mistakes of the past, you will repeat them. If you don't learn from the mistakes of others, we will repeat them. What an incredible tribute to the nation of Rome, to the empire of Rome, if you look at some of their excesses and some of their abuses near the end, near the decline, and you compare that to the United States, it's exactly where we are. Bread and circuses. Give us bread and entertain us. Panem et circenses. Bread and circuses, entertain us. And that's exactly where we are today. So Paul, then, as he moves into verse 25, he addresses their confidence in the flesh. Look at verse 25. For circumcision verily profiteth, and we're going to come back and talk briefly about that. We don't need to give details. I think we're adults. We know what that is. Circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Interesting concepts on that. How could that be counted that? But hopefully we'll, we'll get that when we look back at, uh, at um, uh, Abraham on that. Verse 27, shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee? who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law. Back in Genesis, we won't turn to it. Back in Genesis chapter 17, chapter 15, God had made a covenant with Abraham. God said, I will do this. You know what Abraham's response was? Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed God. Go over to Romans chapter 4 because Paul quotes it. Romans chapter 4. And he's talking, and this whole section from up through at least chapter 4 and into parts of chapter 5 is about the idea of works and law. Is it works? Is it grace? Is it keeping the law? Is it by faith? How does that fit? How does that interrelate? And we looked at James 2 a couple weeks ago. We won't go there again now. But he, what, what about Abraham? Verse 1, Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified, justified means what? Declared righteous. Okay. If Abraham were declared righteous by works, he hath were of the glory. Now let me back up and explain it this way. If Abraham, by doing good, is going to stand before God and say, hey, I made it because I was so good, he can be proud of himself. Yes, if that's how he made it, no one will stand before God and be proud of themselves. So that's why he says, but not before God. And then the all-important question, verse 3. For what saith the preacher? Is that what it says? No. For what saith the scripture? You know the point of that? It doesn't matter what the preacher says, it matters what the scripture says. For what saith the scripture? He goes back to Genesis 15, 6 and he quotes it. Abraham what? Believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness. God saw the faith in his heart and God declared him righteous, which is a good thing because Abraham had some failures after that, didn't he? He still had some failures, but he was justified not by works. He was justified by faith. Now, years later, when he's going to offer up his son Isaac, he demonstrated his righteousness before men. That's what James is talking about. But this is the heart. God, see, God saw that. And so Romans 4 talks about that. Abraham had faith. He was righteous before God. Go a few chapters later, we get to chapter 17, and God gives some commands, starting in about verse 9. You can look it up later. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to practice circumcision. This will mark you off as my people. This will be a covenant symbol for all the males that will say, these are my people. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, if anybody thinks they got reason to be proud of themselves, Paul says, me more. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day of the, of the tribe of Benjamin. And, and he lists out his pedigree. All of this stuff. I was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the top rabbi of his day. That's like saying I went to Harvard. Is that, is that big? Is that, where, is that where the famous person we know went? Maybe we should say Princeton then. We, we should say, I went to Princeton. It's like we should be proud of that, okay? Paul says, I was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. All of these things. And then you go a few verses later and he says, all of that, it's nothing compared to Christ. 
I count all that but dung. It's, but, it's like manure that I might win Christ. Paul wanted to be found in Christ not based on all of the rituals, not based on all of the ceremony. Paul wanted to be found in Christ on the basis of grace through faith. And guess what? That's the only way any of us can be found in Christ. We cannot be found in Christ based on our works. We can be found in Christ only based on his grace. And so he stresses that. All right, let's go back to Romans 2 and talk about some of these things that he lists out here. The idea is the Jews thought that since they were circumcised, they were good to go with God. We're all set. We got it made. We are cool. We don't need anything else. It doesn't matter what we do. We're God's. God is ours. And we can do whatever we want. Paul says, no, no, no. You might have that heritage. You might have that genealogy. You might can trace your family all the way back to Abraham. Doubtful because of the captivities. But even if they could, Paul says it doesn't matter. You have the covenant symbol that marks you off as belonging to God. But if you don't keep the law. Now, I'm going to take you back to what we looked at earlier in Romans 3, 19 and 20. Can keeping the law make you righteous? Absolutely not. However, if a person is a believer, it should show forth in what they do. Keeping the law did not make them righteous. Keeping the law demonstrated that they were a believer. Not keeping the law demonstrated that they were not a believer. Do we get that? Okay, that's a key thing to hold on to here in this section. When he talks about keeping the law and circumcision and all of this. And so he says, verse 28... He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. You know, there are Baptists who think just because they got baptized, they're good to go with God. You don't know what God says about that in the Greek? You can read my lips. Here we go. That's probably not very dignified, but it's pretty accurate. Sorry about that if I got you there. All right. Didn't know you were going to get sprinkled today, huh? All right. Here's the point. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how righteous we think we are. What matters is... What is our relationship with God on the basis of our heart by faith? And the Jews, all they had was a bunch of hot air. No faith, no relationship. And so he says, well, you'd be better off to be a Gentile if you had faith in God and relationship in God. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Verse 29, that circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So that's the text. That's the essence of the text. So what does it mean for us? Let me ask you this. Because of what people... Now, because of what the Jews did, the Gentiles blasphemed the name of God. That's what your guide is. I don't want anything to do with that. I wonder if people look at our lives and see our failures and say, if you're a Christian, I don't want anything to do with that. Do people blaspheme the name of our God because of our hypocrisy? Do we live our lives in such a way that people are drawn to the Savior or are they repelled from the Savior based on what we do? I've known some people who claim to be believers who were very repelling. We should never be that way. We should draw people You know, we are so quick to criticize Israel. We are so quick to condemn Israel. In fact, when I was young, I used to ask myself, how could Israel be so stupid? I mean, God had spoke to them. They had seen the fire. They had seen the cloud. They had watched the sea part. They had gone across on dry ground. They got up the next morning and they saw all the dead Egyptian soldiers all over the seashore and they wrote a song about it. How could they be so stupid? And then as I got older, I noticed the reflection in the mirror. And it was enough for me to deal with what I saw there rather than to worry so much about Israel. You know the reality of life? 
Every one of us will drop the baton sometimes. So I'll come back to that. Charles and Donna, they're out of town. Charles runs our camera. And Donna makes sure the horse has carrots. And any, I know. Uh, <laughs> That was an important thing for Vacation Bible School. One of the big events was not crafts. It was after Vacation Bible School feeding carrots to Charlie. You know, you can't, you can't hardly top that. All right, but in, in any case, he had a thing on Cherokee, North Carolina. Charles is Cherokee and got a tribal registration number and all this. He had a book on Cherokee, and I just quickly browsed through it. I, I like to pick up and browse through. And I noticed there was, in, there was a story of a Cherokee chief who had been given a Bible, and he'd been taught to read English. And they asked him, so what do you think about that Bible? And he said this, he says, it's a pretty good book. What amazes me is that as long as the white man has had this book, it amazes me that he's no better than he is. Wow. Do people look at us and say, wow, if you're a believer, I'm amazed that you are no better than you are. We pick at the Jews. Jesus spoke to them in Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint and east and cumin, and you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not left the others undone. In 1142 of Luke, he says this. You pass over judgment and the love of God. I think if anything should characterize us as believers, it should be, number one, our love for God. Number two, our love for others. And number three, the new command that Jesus gave, our love for one another. You know, Jesus said, by this shall men know you're my disciples if ye have loved one for another. Do you think we always get that right? Nope. Absolutely not. But when we, do, when we miss it, we need to acknowledge it. 2008, Beijing Olympics. Tori Edwards Women's 4x100 relay team. Anybody see that? Anybody recall? Fourth relay. Third relay, actually, from the third to the fourth runner. And she repeated what she had done in the 2004 Olympics. And having done it in the 2004 Olympics, I guarantee you she was saying, I'm not going to drop it, I'm not going to drop it, I'm not going to drop it. And as she made the handoff, it dropped. Of course, at a time like that, well, now I handed it to her, she dropped it. Well, you can have, play all the blame game, can't you? And we come up with our excuses. I lost my cool. I was unkind. Because they. Boy, don't, don't be in the window. Get in the mirror, okay? Get in the mirror. Take responsibility. Well, 2008, not only did Tori Edwards drop it, but in the same race for the men, 4 by 100, Davis Patton to Tyson Gay dropped it. Got some interesting statistics here. 2000, Sydney Olympics. Men won gold, women won bronze. It lists them out there. I'm not going to go over it. But out of 18 opportunities in the 4 by 100 relay, 12 years to win medals in international competitions, the United States men's teams have won three gold, one silver, and they have been disqualified or did not finish five times. The article says the women's team has not fared much better because they too have won three golds, one silver, one bronze, but they've been disqualified four times. Out of 18, five and four is nine. He says this, 50% of the time you can bet that the U.S. will drop the baton in the four by 100 relay. Unless we start pointing fingers, again, back to the mirror, okay? I found an article by a coach of a high school team, and he asked this question, what do you do when you drop the baton? And he says, you pick it up and you run. He says, it's an opportunity to demonstrate leadership, courage, and perseverance. In life, the baton will often get dropped. In the church, the baton will often get dropped. 
in our lives, the baton will often get dropped. May we have the courage, the boldness, and the stamina to pick it up, get back on the track, and to run with endurance the race that is set before us. May we so live our lives that people are drawn to the Savior by the consistency of the walk. And when our talk does better than our walk, may we pick the baton back up and get back in the race. May we firmly grip the baton of truth that has been passed on to us. And may we faithfully run and faithfully finish looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, is what the writer of Hebrews said. May we bow our heads. Father, I thank you for the fact that when we mess up, when we drop the baton, that you don't disqualify us in the race. Rather, we walk in your grace, and your grace is demonstrated in our lives. Father, may we demonstrate that love and grace here in this body of believers. When someone drops the baton, may we lovingly encourage to pick it back up when someone drops the baton, may we cheer for them as they pick it back up and get back in the race. When they fall on the track and they get beaten and bruised and scarred, may we take them into our arms as a body and love them and share with them your love and your grace until they can mend and heal and get back in the race. Father, we would pray that in our lives Jesus might be honored and glorified and that no one might blaspheme the name of our God because of our lives. Father, I would pray for uh, Dan Nolan as he goes down for a visit with family. I'd pray for uh, sister-in-law Joe and the health issues there. I'd pray, Lord, for others in our body. Father, you know the needs. You know some who are here with hurts and with scars. And I pray, God, that you would heal. And I pray, God, that you would use us as a body to be a part of that process. We thank you for your grace and for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Good to have you with us. Remind our church family of the offering plates. Be faithful. If anyone has any special needs, if anyone wants to talk to me, I'll be hanging around. I'm usually one of the last ones to leave. So if you have a need, we're available. God bless y'all.